the first Boston album was very simple. It wasn't complex at all. Mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right. Well, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. Today, my guest is, again, it's Chris Bruyere. He's back for round two. Um, this time, we're going to kind of talk more about Chris's musical journey for himself and all that. Not we probably Central will get, we'll weave Central in, of course. But oh, yeah. This it, is going to be more either. about uh, your, yeah, your journey, Chris. So, why don't you tell the audience, well, let, let me put it to you this way. This is my imagination. So this is me growing up in, in, in the Puget Sound region in the 70s. Uh, I was a kid who found popular music. So, you know, 70s rock and roll, which probably shouldn't be rec- re- remembered by anybody. But you ended up getting started in jazz. How did you, how did you find jazz or did jazz find you? Uh, that actually started way back in junior high band. I had a really okay. progressive band director. His name was Stefan Sandvik. And, uh, what he did was we didn't really have, well, we had a jazz band. We did have a jazz band. I do remember that. And I remember playing, there was a, a Woody Herman. Woody Herman was a, a well-known band leader that had had a, a big band in existence since the dance band era, but was in the seventies, super popular and had really okay. cool records. And anyway, but we played an old Woody Herman thing called Woodchopper's ball. That It was just a blues. I didn't know anything. I didn't really know. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know how to count the rhythms. I just had to kind of learn it by ear. But anyway, that was my first exposure to quote jazz. But the, my teacher, Stefan Sandvik, during our activity period, which was like exploratory kind of stuff, he decided to have an improvisation thing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And I had no idea what improvisation was. I had, I didn't know anything. But he goes, well, pick these notes here. These are the notes of the chord. And I'm going, chords? What are chords? I don't know anything. <laughs> and so that that was the start. <laughs> that got me going. I I certainly was not successful, you know, but it picked my interest. And then um, during my junior high years, I remember this was back when schools would have full school assemblies for guest music groups. And I remember mm-hmm. two groups came. One was the high school, Linwood High School. Jazz band came and played. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that is the coolest stuff I've ever heard. But also, Western Washington University came, and I was just blown away. I thought, I got to do this, because there's trumpets up there, and I play trumpet, and I can do this stuff. At the same time, I was getting into the group Chicago. Um, you know, that was good stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there yeah. were horns in that. And so I, I had this, I still have this book, I transcribed as best I could, all the trumpet parts to, uh, I guess it would be Chicago 2 and parts of Chicago 6, et cetera. And I would play along with the records all the time. And then also I had an uncle that introduced me to the Tijuana Brass, which was also trumpets. And I had some Tijuana Brass books and it's funny, somebody, it's, when I was a student at Central, said, you used to listen to a lot of Tijuana Brass, didn't you? And I said, well, how do you know? He goes, because <laughs> I can hear it in your playing. And I was like, uh-oh, you know, because that's not like the coolest music if you're a jazzer to listen to. Although, it was kind of progressive to that, that music that was put together by Herb Alpert. Herb Alpert was actually a jazz trumpet player. And he started A and M uh-huh. Records, one of the one of the biggest labels that still exists. And Hal, or Herb Alpert is the currently uh, highly supportive of jazz education to this day. And he's like mm-hmm. ninety or something. I don't know. 
Anyway, so that's how I got into it. To my understanding. Actually, I remember hearing about that. Yeah. So a friend of mine, I I know a friend of mine saw him recently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so, um, you know, so I played, I played through high school. So then what happened during high school, I got into vocal jazz too. Um, I had written some original songs and the vocal jazz director at Linwood High School heard me and he, he took me aside. He goes, how would you like to be in vocal jazz next year and write arrangements for vocal jazz? I was like, uh, okay, how do you write arrangements? <laughs> I don't really know anything about that stuff. So he gave me a couple of books and a couple of recordings. And the first one I, that I tried to do was uh, a tune called Twisted that Joni Mitchell had recorded on an album of hers. I had no idea, one, that Twisted was a blues. I didn't even know what a blues was. And that would have changed things. But I transcribed the tune as best I could off of a, a little handheld cassette and using my guitar. <laughs> you know, it was just like, it's so different these days as everyone can imagine. So I did that. Um, I had to convince my mom and dad to let me be in the vocal jazz because that was going to be three music classes my junior year. And, you know, it, but in those uh, days you could do that in high school. You didn't have to right, graduate with huge credits and stuff. And anyway, so I did that. And then I, I got interested in uh, writing big band charts. And I was really lucky my um, freshman year of high school, Gary Marsh was my director. and He was a arranger writer in his background. Yeah. So he started giving me arranging lessons. And uh, I wrote some things. And then I got invited to go... My senior year, Stefan Sandvik, my junior high director, was now teaching at the high school. He uh, um, nominated me to go to this this workshop at Centrum. Now, we know today that the Centrum workshops at Port Townsend have been in existence for 40 years or something. But this thing that I got to go to was um, part of their talented and gifted program and the, the, the it was a three or four day thing. I can't remember. It was all about arranging and jazz. And that's where I met Barney McClure, who ironically ended up doing an album at Central with him years later. But he played his little arrangement of piano on Happy Birthday with all these cool chords. And I just went, oh, I can't believe this. It's the coolest. Can I say a bad word? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. It was You're the coolest shit ever. <laughs> the coolest All shit right. I'd, ever, I'd ever heard. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it. And then I also met um, uh, Bob Panari, who we talked about on the last um, meeting. He was my tr- ended up being my trumpet teacher, but I met him at this workshop as well um, through a couple of work, a couple of hour long sessions that he did. Anyway, that, really got me going. And the, the whole idea of this workshop was to um, write an arrangement based on the time that we were there and bring it back two or three months later to a follow-up workshop where the uh, Navy big band that was based at that time at Sandpoint in Seattle, they were going to play mm-hmm. all of our charts. Well, I was the only oh. one that showed up okay. with a fully written chart <laughs> and I actually had two oh. charts I was I was so into it and so that's that's really where I got my my love of everything years ago and I just kept pursuing it and pursuing it so the, the year after high school I went to uh, Shoreline Community College I wrote a bunch of charts when I was there I played in the big band I wrote stuff for both the uh, uh, vocal jazz and the big band. And uh, it was during that time that I talked about in our last session, I talked about going and visiting Central when I was at Shoreline and uh, ended up going over to Central where I, I continued to write charts. Um, I didn't get quite the reception at Central to my writing that I had at previous locations 
because John Mallard was very, uh, son, this isn't a very good ending on this chart. You know, he would do that kind of coaching of my, of my writing. And I, and I was kind of resistant to that, but I did get to interface with, uh, Bob Panario and I ended up taking his jazz band arranging class. It wasn't right away because I, I couldn't, didn't have all the prerequisites lined up, but I continued to do that. And so that's how I, I got into jazz. And I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, where you want to go from this, but I ended up teaching high school right after Central for, right. uh, for five years, actually six years. And then I ended well, up teaching. Before we go there. Before yeah. we go there, let me let's back up. So, as a kid, was was your household musically? Was it a no. musical household? Not no. at all. No. And so, uh, I don't know where it came from. I mean, we didn't really okay. have records, jazz records. Um, well, like, what did your did your parents listen to music at all as you growing up in the in not, the car? Not, not, not like I would. Not like I listen to music now. You know, they didn't well, do that. Okay. Um, they didn't. We had a record player and, you know, I had some records, but I ended up like making my own. We had, we had an, a na- um, not a neighbor, but a, a relative that had an old monophonic console. And I asked my, okay. he gave it to us. I asked my dad if I could take all the stuff out of it and cut it up and make speaker cabinets out of the case. <laughs> And so I did all that kind of stuff because I, I really wanted my own sound listening pl- thing in my room, you know, mm-hmm. and that was really the only way I could do it. Um, so, so I had that. So and then did, I, go ahead. Did you have any like older siblings or anything no, like that that were? Nothing. Okay. I didn't have anything. No one, no one was showing me the way. And I, you know, I often wonder if somebody would have been playing the right records for me what might have happened because I was just by chance well, I, doing stuff. I remember when I, when I arrived at central Mallard goes, you know, son, you need to do some more listening. And uh, so I went out and bought some Miles Davis records. I, I hadn't listened to Miles Davis really until I was in college. You know, the things okay. I should have been listening to earlier in my development I didn't start listening to until I was in college because I just didn't know. No one was there to tell me anything. Even my high school and junior high teachers, they didn't say, listen to this. I mean, that's like a, a staple of teaching jazz now. It's listen, listen, listen. So, you know, there's listening lists out there that have been developed, uh, individual tracks or lists of albums that you should check out, you know, and so, so students today, and this is provided, of course, that the director, their teacher is turning them on to this stuff. It's just so easy. <laughs> Get on Spotify, check this out. Oh, that's how you do it. So, but anyway, you know, you're, you're kind of alluding to, there wasn't a whole lot of background going on in my development about how, how to do music. I just had this love for it. And I would say I was extremely driven to, I just, I wanted to find out how it worked. So there was even a time, because I wasn't just into jazz. I I liked pop music a lot. And you mentioned seventies rock. So I loved that (laughs) stuff. Like uh, I remember a friend of mine was in the vocal jazz group at the high school. We transcribed most of the first Boston album on our guitars we, oh, wow. I, we, okay. I learned how to, I learned how chord progressions worked from doing that. That's, you I, know, learned, that I learned how to play Stairway album. to Heaven. <laughs> the first Boston album was very simple. It wasn't complex at all. <laughs> mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah. I, I'm joking. I, yes. I'm, I put that on uh, not long ago and I listened to it and I was like, wow, this was, this was pretty good. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I was yeah. into... Led Zeppelin a little bit, but I was always into stuff with horns because I was a horn player. And so I was a super right. fan of Chicago. I started going to Chicago. Chicago would come to Seattle every year and play at the Coliseum. 
And I went every year okay. from about yeah. ninth, ninth grade on when I was still okay. in, in Seattle. So those guys are my heroes. And, you know, I, I didn't know till just a few years ago when I started looking at their, they have a really good website now that talks about their history. Those guys were all jazz majors at uh, DePaul University in Chicago. Okay. So, right. you know, that's, I could, maybe that had an influence on me, but, you know, they definitely were not playing jazz, but they were influenced by it. I really got turned on about Did you like Ch Chicago's long instrumental things that they would put on their records, you know, that weren't the stuff that you heard on the radio. So were you a fan so, of Tower of Power? I didn't really know about Tower of Power. Um, okay. I became a fan. I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Tower of Power, but I, I had heard about like what is hip and all that stuff. And I was like, wow. That, and, but I didn't, I don't really didn't get a chance to delve into it. I didn't have any records of them. Um, okay. But I should have, I was into Stevie wonder um, and okay. uh, earth, wind and fire. Those mm -hmm. kind of things. Mm -hmm. Did you ever so, see earth, wind and fire perform live? I never did. I bet it was a spectacle. I, 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 I saw, I've been to a lot of concerts in my life and that I saw them in 1980 in Seattle. And that's consistently one of the top three concert memories that I have of, of yeah. seeing. Uh, that was like the peak was, of what they were all about. A peak. It was, I think according to Wansley, cause, um, he was, you know, and still is just a huge, huge fan of the band. The, the tour before was probably a little bit more over the top, like mm. from a theatrical standpoint, this one was a little, this was still over the top for me. I was like, but he saw the one before and I think 70, 79 or 80 or no, excuse me, 78 or 79. And, um, anyway, I saw him in the Seattle center in 1980 and was just, dumbfounded by how entertaining and how wonderful it sounded the whole show the entire time. Yeah. It was, it was, it was magical. They were they, they did great, great performance. I just saw on Facebook. You, 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 couple, you make these references that like, go ahead. Whoops. No, you, you make these references that you weren't exposed though to things that maybe you quote unquote should have been. I don't know. Do you think that that maybe did, did something to help you create your own interpretation, your own way without maybe being influenced by, okay, like let's just say you would have started listening to um, Miles Davis when you were 14. Mm -hmm. Would would that, I mean, it's hard to go back and guess, but what would that, you know, that might've changed your, the way you approached music. So I don't know that it was necessarily detrimental I, I agree. I don't think it was detrimental, but for me to be a quote jazz guy, I got a later start than what kids do these days. I would say okay. what happened with me was not uncommon because access to recordings. Um, I mean, you had to go to a record store and buy a record. <laughs> you didn't just have the ability to, uh, download something or stream something and, and check it out right away. Right. Um, and it's a curious thing. Like my, my son's a musician and he grew up in the YouTube age. And so there, there are these things in the jazz world called fake books. And ironically, the, the most well-known fake book is called the real book. <laughs> Anyway, that, that's a jazz lingo thing. Anyway, so I, I gave okay. him uh, I gave him a, a copy of the real book, volume one, for his birthday or Christmas. Well, he sat down in front of the family computer and started typing in titles to YouTube. And he came to me and he goes, Dad, have you ever heard of Miles Davis? <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, I have heard of Miles Davis. And so... Um, he was, I think, in <laughs> middle school at the time. So he started checking out all this stuff that was on YouTube when he was in middle school. 
And now he's he's like a pro musician doing jazz, pop, rock, funk in New York City. Because uh, he had this certain background. Of course, he had a, a drive to do music like I did. Uh, but he ended up being a very, very competent and uh, high quality performer. And, and that's that's his career. What does he play? What instrument? He's a bass player. Okay. So when you were at Central, were you involved in any um, side projects, on, you know, outside of classes? Yeah. Did you play in any? One of the okay. first things I what played in do? was a, I played in a funk band my first year there. We were called Tighten Up. I don't even remember why we called ourselves that, but um, <laughs> that ended up going through that, that first full year and I, and I was also in a couple of jazz combos, small groups. I was just, I was mm -hmm. doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and that, that group tighten up. We tried to go out on the road, but we just couldn't quite swing it. And we had, we had two, uh, the fr two front guys were two African Americans, um, Derek and Jeff Slack. Derek, uh, I can't remember Derek's last name, but Jeff Slack was the bass player. Uh, okay. And we ended up getting a gig in Sandpoint, Idaho. Imagine how that went with two black guys in the van. That's a... We got we yeah. got kicked off the stage and told to leave town, literally. Um, wow. And and that was pretty much the end of the end of the band. Okay. So anyway, that was my first big side project. But um a couple of years later. I got asked, asked to produce, I guess, no, it was back, it was when I was doing my master's degree. And when I was doing my master's deg degree, well, let me back up, if I might. All the way through, through um, my undergraduate degree at Central, I was involved in jazz combos, as well as the big bands, of course. And uh, I was also the the president of the jazz club that was affiliated with the national association of jazz educators. And so we used to put on events that were Nash sponsored events. Some of those were mm -hmm. pay a dollar and you get a cup <laughs> kind of events uh, to make money. As soon as uh, uncle John, John Mallet found out that we were having keggers to raise money for jazz. <laughs> Son, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> it's not good for PR. <laughs> so we stopped doing that. So we thought, so we thought, okay, we're going to have to do something else. So we started putting on uh, combo nights of, cause there were a lot of combos functioning in the department and some of them were pretty good. Um, so we, we put on these, these combo nights. So I was in a bunch of different combos. Um, they always had funny names like the skid marks or, electric donuts <laughs> <laughs> or okay some other and, we, and i my arranging uh i don't know if prowess is the right word just my my arranging came into the four there where i would arrange things in quirky funny ways or, or we tried to take like miles davis's tune four and do it in three which was in a swing four four to the bar thing we do. We try to play it in three or in five, four, things like that. We are we are trying to push the envelope about how can we make this stuff be our own, you know, which was mm -hmm. that's part of the jazz legacy is take something and try to change it into today, you know. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I did that. I graduated. Then I. Um, I came back the next year as a graduate student. I th we talked about that on my last session with you, but I, the big side project that I did during my two years during that time was, I pr was asked to produce an album for this group called the Twang Babies. Kind of a, a crazy name. And mm -hmm. I had heard these, these guys were all uh, music department people. I knew all of them. But they were, the the music was country western, but it was country western that was humorous, because everybody doing this music 
were, were either opera singers or classical singers or classical drummers, bass players, whatever. The whole group was were these people. And the way the group actually started was, was three guys. Um, what was the one guy's name? I always forget. Uh, Mike Jacobson, a piano player. Tom Bourne, who was actually the guitar teacher at Central. And Steve Piha, they used to sit around and write country songs because it, on the country songs like Woe or Me kind of country songs because they couldn't get dates. So they'd sit around and drink beer and write country songs on Fridays and Saturday nights. <laughs> and some of these songs, some of these songs were hilarious. I couldn't believe it. That was the thing that caught, that caught me the most about their material is just like funny as hell, you know, like. And so that's what it was. It was like two years of uh, constant laughing. And, you know, when they asked me to produce their record, I was like, well, what's a producer? What, are, what do producers do? And they said, oh, you know, you just kind of tell us what to do. And I'm going, well, I don't know what you want to do. I, I don't know this style of music. What, how, how do I do that? So anyway... We ended up doing first a four-tune cassette because cassettes were something you could mass produce yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And so so we did that, and uh, we did it all right in Ellensburg. There was a studio downtown called Creative Fire, and it was owned by Sam Albright, who's still here in town. Uh, but Sam... Sam Sam ran this company called Alto's Easy Mats, which is a a system for cutting uh, mats for pictures. You know, how you mat, use okay. matting and you kind of build it up. Yeah. His dad his dad had invented the Alto. His dad's name was Alto. <laughs> and uh, he ended up running the company that manufactured these things right in Ellensburg. And so he had some extra cash and he decided to indulge his musical fantasies because he was a guitar player, singer, and was in rock bands. And so he, he bought this building right down by the, the old train station and made it into a recording studio. And in the process of doing that, he brought in a guy named Peter Carl, who just graduated from the recording program at Eastern Washington University. To He brought him in to wire the whole thing, to hook everything up. And that's where I met Peter Carl. Was, he was, he okay. was the engineer at this studio and it was, it had just been put together and finished. It was beautiful, all this beautiful wood and some of the latest, not not the greatest, but some of the latest equipment of the day. And uh, so we we did this this four tune cassette there, and the two guys that were the main leaders of it, Steve Piha and Tom Bourne, thought it was so successful, at least how it turned out musically. They go, we're going to make a whole LP now. And I was like, I thought my time with them was over. Although it was really fun. I was like, I was in the studio till midnight many times a week, sometimes one or two in the morning. We would always order out Big John dogs or Big John, the Big John burgers. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. And also we bring in a half rack of black label beer to get us through. Oh, anyway, you were upscale. Yeah, we are upscale. <laughs> So I said, okay, okay, count me in. I'll do this. I'll do, I'll do the LP too. Because the, their idea was that the LP was going to be far more sophisticated in terms of the recordings and the tunes than, it w than the cassette was. We weren't going to reuse any. We were going to redo the tunes that we'd done on the cassette and then add probably eight more to them to get a full album. And so... Along the way, I was learning how to be a producer. Well, being a producer, what comes into play was actually all the skills that I had already acquired, which was how do you lead a group? How do you write arrangements? How do you decide what style a certain tune would be? How do you tell a bass player how to play a bass line that's appropriate to play this tune the first, and the drummer and the keyboard player? So I was like a, a director, arranger, coach head decider person and sometimes we'd get into right. little clashes about we'd get into little clashes about how 
a tune might go and I go, well, I don't think it works this way because blah, 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 blah. And that's maybe where my pop music background came into play because these guys, some of them hadn't listened to as much pop music as I had. And I, I would go, well, it doesn't work because it's things are out of proportion or some other thing is happening that's not cool. And it also allowed me to know how to write the horn. We had horn parts on a, a few of the tunes. So I, I wrote horn parts that were akin to Chicago, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, etc. I played on mm-hmm. some of them. We brought in other, play, other people to play on things because you couldn't overdub like you can now. We were limited to eight tracks on the tape, so we had mm-hmm. to figure out how to be creative. Anyway, to make a, a long story shorter... <laughs> Uh, I ended up producing this record. It came out and it was called Winnebago Weekend. And you might remember, I I was actually talking to a young person a couple of weeks ago. (laughs) This young person did not know what a Winnebago was. I said, well, it's an RV. It's these, you see them going down the road. I mean, my grandma had an R, had a Winnebago. Anyway, uh, after the record came out, I left to teach high school in Oregon. Uh, Peter, the engineer, Peter Carl, had an offer to go to Ocean Way Studios in L.A. to be an assistant engineer. And it, it was the summer before my first teaching job, and he goes, do you want to come with me? And I was like, oh, because I... I knew from my experience, even though it was, you know, small town, I knew that I could do something in the, in the recording industry. Um, but I didn't do it. And he didn't go to ocean way. He ended up going back to New York where he was from. Um, but that was kind of a pivotal moment. I I always wonder if I would have said, yes, let's go to, let's go to LA. I don't know what would have happened. It's, It's really hard to say. But right. I never lost my, my love for recording from that experience because I learned so much. Everything that I do now, recording-wise, I learned in that studio from Peter Carl, who's now a good friend, uh, lifelong friend. He was in my wedding. Um, and just the process of, of how things, how you stack up tracks and what works and what doesn't. Um, but that that's... That was a big part of my my development as, as a musician was this recording stuff that I got to do early on. And I continued to do that when I was teaching high school. I recorded, I took the band, the, the jazz bands, the concert bands. We went to into a studio. I was teaching near Portland. So we went into some Portland studios and recorded. I had people come out and record us there. I showed students how to, at that time, MIDI was becoming a big thing. And I was doing a lot of MIDI stuff. Um, I showed mm-hmm. students how you could play a keyboard into a computer and stack up almost limitless numbers of tracks, depending on the hardware that you had. Um, and during that same time, I was, I was starting to develop a jazz improvisation system uh, that was going to use MIDI-based stuff as a teaching tool. And okay. I got up through my, my friend who was one of the Twang Babies, um, uh, Steve Piha, he ended up getting a job with a company in Boston that wrote the user manuals, uh, the support documents for the first version of Finale notation software, which was, you know, I couldn't believe it. He, I, I ended up flying out to Boston and he showed me this stuff on a nine inch Macintosh screen. And I had, finished just a couple of years before writing page after page of ink copied parts. And I said, if I would have had this software when I was in my master's program, I could have saved literally months of busy work copying ink on paper, you know, timings, everything. So he, he ended up going down that road. Uh, he got me, it, he got me into the, the computer side of things and learning about MIDI. And uh, he stayed in that, that whole technology thing uh, for many years in the music side of, of technology. Now he's a freelance techno guru in Seattle and he actually works part of his income. He drives from working for Google 
as a contract worker. Um, but anyway, uh, so the recording thing was a big deal with me. And everywhere I went, I did it. When I was at Mount Hood Community College in Gresham, Oregon, I flew Peter Carl, my friend, the engineer from the Twang Baby Records, I flew him out from New York four, four years in a row, him lugging recording gear in backpacks and me providing what we could <laughs> on our end. And we recorded the jazz band and mixed a full CD in three days because that's all the time he could give. Oh. <laughs> um, and wow. so I did that okay. four times. So, and some of these CDs, um, I, well, I shouldn't say some, I think all of them eventually got played tunes off of them on KMHD jazz radio in Portland. Um, you know, and that was, that was a life changing thing to hear. I'm driving down the road in my car, listening to KMHD jazz radio and the track is playing that I did, you know, I was the director. I did, I wasn't performing, but nonetheless, it was my work up there. So when I, I was all right after Mount hood that I came to central and I, I continued the whole recording thing here. Um, we were lucky we had our own recording engineer in the department and uh, I was able to coax him into letting me set up all the gear in the old music building band room. And I recorded the first CD of the jazz band that I directed my very first year at central 2003, I think spring of 2003. Um, I think I did another one later, but the biggest deal one that, well, there were two two albums that I did at Central that were big deals. The first was an alumni record, a CD, uh, right after John Mao had died. Um, we decided to to do a CD of alums from Central dedicated to him. And so um, we recorded the whole thing at Central. I ended up editing and mixing it myself, and uh, I really honed my... Everything that I'd, that I'd learned from Peter Carl, which included the times that he came out to Mount Hood where I would assist with the mixing and the recording, um, I applied that to this project at, at Central. And a bunch of those tunes have been played on radio. I think EWU, Jazz Radio, KEWU in Spokane's played them. Um, I think Seattle, KPLU played a few tracks. Then and again, yeah. so that was a that was the first big deal, and I I was actually awarded a, an artistic achievement by the college for that CD. So that was cool. But the the biggest deal one that I did was actually a pro record. You you might remember a few minutes ago I talked about Barney McClure, who I met as a high school kid at a Centrum workshop. Well, he. He was somebody that had come and played at the annual jazz festival here in Ellensburg that I was a part of the, the board that put the thing together. And so I got to know, know him, just talking with him, hanging out. And I said, you know, it'd be really cool if you would come and be a guest at Central on some of our, one of our concerts. So I don't remember exactly what year. It might have been 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. We had him come out and we did some of his tunes with him playing B3 organ. He was a, he's a B3 organ player. And we had just okay. received a donation of a pristine B3 in the department. And so it was like a cool thing to try out this organ with him playing it live on stage, et cetera, et cetera. So it was about a year later, he contacted me. He goes, you know, I want to do an album of Hammond B3 organ with big band would you be willing to have the central band be the band that does that? And I was like, absolutely. Because to me, that's like the coolest thing ever for students. We're going to record a real album that's going to get released on a label and you guys are going to be the band on it. You know, I, of course I had to ask permission and stuff to do it and everybody was cool with it. So we ended up recording this. And the guy that did most of the charts, um, I forget his last name. His name is Phil. He lives up in Bellingham. He had been affiliated with all kinds of pro bands. And uh, he came out of the North Texas program, and he was a hell of a writer. 
Well, he heard he heard the tracks the band did, and he got a hold of me. He goes, I can't believe how good your band is. It just it's killer. This is as good as North Texas State or University of North Texas as they're known now. And I was like, really? It's really? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so anyway, during that process, you know, I'm I'm telling the student. I'm first of all, I'm coaching the students before we even do it on how to play the music, which you know. I'm being a producer in that in re- regard. Um, I'm trying to figure out what he wrote on the page, how it really was supposed to sound, because these weren't these weren't tunes that had been recorded before. So I had to take what's mm-hmm. on the page and try to figure out from my knowledge and background what appropriate ways for the rhythm section to play, how to how the horns should style their lines, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we ended up doing it the right way because he loved it the writer and uh when uh when barney came and we re- we we had the music building set up i think that the organ was in a separate room the piano was in a separate room we we did it you know headphone mixes for everybody it was like the real deal and uh it was just astounding and i remember our recording engineer at, at the department um alan larson and thank god for him because we could not have done it without him. Without him. He, he had the foresight years before that to acquire all the equipment to actually do this kind of stuff. You know, state-owned recording stuff. Anyway, he would, he would watch me, like we would, we would record a take and we'd, we'd go into the, everybody go into the booth and listen. And um, Barney would go, well, we got to do blah, 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 and we got to change this and that. And so I would go back into the, the big room where all the horns are and on headphones and I'm talking to the whole band, wherever, whatever room they were in. And I'd say, okay, we have to cut four bars here and then we're going to add eight here and we're going to repeat this thing here. And the recording engineer said, how, how do you do that? And I said, I don't know. It's, that's just how we operate. Cause what I was doing with the students was something that would happen in nearly every rehearsal. We would change stuff and they would just have to have a pencil out and, or, and, or remember or both what's going on and they'd have to be on top of it. And I was just so proud of them during those moments because that's how it happened. They were on top of it enough that it was like a pro band. And anyway, Mm -hmm. that record's out there. You can, you can find it on Spotify. Um, What's it called? It's Barney McClure, (laughs) CW big band, but I can't remember the, the actual name of the record. That's not good. But it's out there. So that all this stuff, that that whole process of recording at Central actually goes back even like earlier to 2010, let's say, when we started doing multi-track recording of our live concerts. And I talked about this a little bit during our last meeting, but we were continuing to do that. But this this album we made with um, Barney McClure was like a huge peak experience. And that was the year before the band ended up going and winning the Next Generation Jazz Festival and playing on the Monterey Jazz Festival. I'm, and that was a, most of the same personnel. And I'm convinced the recording process, the recording culture that we had done at Central for years contributed to them being the best band at that festival and ended up going, you know, to one of the biggest jazz festivals in the world, the Monterey Jazz Festival, and performing, you know, and just bringing the house down. It was, you know, those were special years, for sure. So you, you, you talk a lot about, you know, music, you know, recording, production, you know, all of that. And, you know, back when you, when you recorded the uh, Winnebago Weekend with tape, right? I mean, yes. you, you go back to, you know, tape, and now we have everything's digital. Do you, in your daily life now, are you, are you set up at home to record? Yeah. I haven't done any recording since, since I stopped teaching. Uh, But 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 where I'm going with this, mm -hmm. what's your home setup like? Well, I have a, you might, you want like brands and gear and all that? 
Well, I mean, so the point is, though, is that you, you, what you have in your house today is, I'm guessing, I've never, I've never seen your, your setup, but I'm going to guess that the equipment that you have in your house today, which is maybe a big setup, maybe it's not, but it would infinitely more powerful than what you were doing oh, yeah. in the 80s. Definitely so. I mean, yeah. like we talked briefly at our last session about how I, uh, during COVID, you know, we were virtual at central um how we were we were recording tracks some at the school people would send me tracks um they'd put them up on a on dropbox or google drive and then i would retrieve their tracks and i'd assemble them at my house so yeah i was using my own gear here at the house so i i use uh uh, logic pro which is an apple based Mm multi-track pro level uh multi-track recorder, uh, what do we call it? Digital audio workstation, DAW is how we refer to these things these days. Mm-hmm. And so I got very adept at that during my COVID time. So I had used it, <laughs> I'd used it about every, like I, I talked about this at our last meeting, how when we started recording the uh, home concerts, multi-track that maybe I didn't talk about this, but I'll just, I'll be repeating myself if I did. Um, you heard me talk about Alan Larson. He was the guy that said, we should start doing multi-track recordings of concerts. And I was like, are you sure? That's a lot of work. But he got a system down where he could actually mix, do a rough mix of all the tracks in maybe 30 minutes a tune, which is not very long. Wow. And then I would take those tracks and I would spend probably two to three hours with each track and I would tweak all the levels, EQs, et cetera. All, this is all within Logic. So I was very good at it. So when I got my own copy of Logic here at home and I was assembling everything, I, you know, I'd have been using it for years. And so that's, that's how I did stuff. And that, so I, I run it on a MacBook Pro with a, with a monitor. I have a, a mixing board with, um, it's a Mackie mixing board that has USB out. And that's my interface, if you will. Um, I also uh-huh. have another, MOTU Mark of the Unicorn interface that I'm using to talk to you right now that I use when I'm, when I'm teaching uh, my trumpet lessons remotely, like when I'm on the road traveling, I have this in my suitcase. And so I can use my, this plus my MacBook plus a couple of mics. And I'm, I usually use uh, zoom to do those lessons. Um, See, that's yeah, just I've it. got, it's in your suitcase. Exactly. It's, it's in, you, you carry it with you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and there you can That's, do a lot of a lot of the stuff that I do. You can do it on an iPad now. You don't even well, and, need a computer per se. No, and and you're using something that's more robust. But think about what GarageBand can do. Right, the software that Apple Apple gives you for free well, if when you buy their products. But you know, GarageBand's mm-hmm. included. And you can, I mean, I've got GarageBand on my phone. Not that I know how to do anything with it, but it's on my phone. Yeah. If somebody, you know, I used GarageBand for a number of Right. I used GarageBand for a number of years, especially when I needed to develop a simple track for jazz piano class or improv class. Um, And I could do that in my office easily with it, with a mic, Um, you know, but you're right. You, you can carry it in your pocket. I have GarageBand on my phone too. I never use it, but GarageBand's basically um, a dumbed down, if you will, version of Logic Pro. It's the the same concepts. And this is what's so cool to me about Logic Pro and all of the DAWs. It's a tape-based paradigm Mm -hmm. or interface, if you will. I mean, you're, you're rolling stuff. You're rolling stuff in front of you. It's going by. And so all the stuff that I learned using tape all those years ago, it's like right there in front of me. It's the same exact way of thinking of stuff. Um, right. And it's, it's interesting to see students that have never dealt with tape work through. They don't really understand <laughs> why, why you call things certain things within the software. And I go, well, that's from the tape days. What do you mean tape? <laughs> you know, so I show him a cassette. And I said, "See that stuff in there in the side the cassette that rolls by a head." Anyway, um, 
but oh, that's, that's one so of the, the cool things about this, this, these projects that I did with the students during COVID is um, we've known at Central for years that students needed to have some music tech classes, if you will, like music notation, music recording, but we could never fit it in the, the curriculum. So most students had never used a DAW before, or if they had, oh. it was very surface, you know, not, not deep at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I got feedback after we did all these projects, that was the number one thing that students mentioned that they were so thankful that they got to learn how to record. And I kept stressing to them the whole time. I said, you're recording in your bedroom. I'm recording. I'm assembling it here. It's somebody in the bands over in Boise, Idaho, recording their part. This is how it works in today's recording world. And right. you're getting experience doing this that could lead to something for you. Just like all that stuff for me led to something early in my career. Right. Who knows what could happen? Um, like I know a, a guy, we had a, uh, a guest artist come many years ago, a violinist, a jack, really killer jazz violinist. But his thing at the time, and he still does this, was to do, in essence, what we were doing with movie soundtracks, string parts. And he had a, assembled a whole army of violin, viola, cello, and bass players from throughout the world to be part of his, his projects. You had to have the same mic and interface so that the recording engineer could count on having everything sounding the same. You, you had to know how to mic it up properly. But you would get the music sent to you by PDF. You would play it in. And you might be playing along with some other tracks. You might not be. You might just be playing with a click track. But then you would post it to Dropbox or Google Drive. Somebody would assemble it. And so this guy was able to provide movie studios with string orchestra backing tracks in a matter of days for a lot less money because people were doing it from their houses. And I thought, that's pretty cool. You have to rent studio time. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's good for the music industry, especially people that are used to being studio musicians, but it's a, it's a way the world is going, so to speak. And that's, I think one of the best things that my students learned during COVID is how to record. Well, now that you're no longer, I don't want to use the word retired. That's just, but you're no longer actively working at Central Washington University. Yeah. How's that? Actually, I'm going to teach there next fall. You are. Yeah, I'm going to teach one class. It's my jazz piano class that I started many years ago. They're going to bring me back to teach that. Okay. Which is going to be great. How about I'm your teach music? It. Pardon? How about your music? What are you going to do now? Well, when I retired, I thought I would be... After doing all that recording, I was I was sure that I was going to actually try to record some original music where I would play... Piano, I'd play the bass lines, I'd play trumpet. Um, I wasn't so sure about playing drums, but maybe some hand percussion. Anyway, maybe percussion, computerized stuff. I don't know. I was thinking about doing that. I just haven't done it. It's like we talked about at our last session. I was going to do a bunch of, of writing, arranging, and you know, some things tailored to the middle school jazz band world where there's not as much well-written music in my opinion. I thought I could do something there. And so I thought I would get into writing, but I've, like I think I said last time, I've only opened the software and looked at it for about 30 minutes, but I did open it yesterday for 10 minutes. <laughs> I looked at it. There we go. And okay. I found out that now there's it's version 4.2 and I have 3.5. So things have changed <sighs> since the last time I opened it. <laughs> Okay. Well, you open so, you know, more frequently. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I, w- I want to do, I want to still be creative from a recording standpoint, part, standpoint or be creative from a performing standpoint, uh, arranging, writing. I just haven't done it yet. Okay. Well, are you, are you playing live? I think I saw that you were playing live at a, at a local winery somewhere in the central area. Yeah, we're you, actually that was yesterday. 
that was yesterday at oh. uh, the Seasons in Yakima, which is I talked. We talked about that as one of my venues that I've appreciated performing mm-hmm. at and seeing things at. But we ended up canceling because of the heat. Oh, um, they they were expecting zero crowd to show up, and so they said, mm-hmm. "Let's just rebook it uh, for the future." So we're okay. going to do that same gig is now going to happen August 14th at the seasons. So yeah, I I still play. Um, I'm not, I don't go out and hustle gigs like some people do, you know, when stuff comes, comes to me, I'll, I'll do it. But that's one of the bummers of being a a trumpet player. Um, If you don't gig a lot, you're not playing a lot. And if you don't practice then every day, you don't you 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 lose endurance. It's one of the first things you lose is endurance, and then the ability to just play with precision. And mm-hmm. I started to question whether or not I want to be a trumpet player anymore, just for that very fact that it's every day. Da, 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 da. You go through all this routine of playing a brass instrument that if you don't do it. When you do get a call to play a gig, you might not be ready to do it. Um, mm. Like I got a a call a few weeks ago to to sub on a big band here in Ellensburg, and I really hadn't been playing my horn more than like five or ten minutes a day for a couple of weeks, and it was going to be a two hour gig, and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can make it through the gig. I ended up being able to do it, but luck and luckily I had a week ahead of time to know, so I was like hitting it right. hitting it hard. And trying to not go too hard, where I would be just burned out by the time of the gig. It's a it's a fine well, line. Let me ask you, because you, uh, uh, yeah, let me ask you. So you, you you before you got the phone call, you were you're picking up your horn five to ten minutes a day. Okay, yeah. You get the call. Now you're like, okay, I gotta kind of get prepared, but I don't want to overdo it. So what what did that practice sessions? What did that look like? Getting prepped for that gig. Well, <laughs> it's a lot of lip slurs. <laughs> I don't know if that means anything to you, but it's it's a it's one of the fundamental things as a brass player that you got to be able to do, and it's just time on the face. And so you run through this routine of exercises. It may not be the same exact routine every, from day to day, but it's the same concept of things. I try to to mix it up, and then I'm all and so that's that's working on just your what you call your embouchure. You know the way that your face interfaces with the horn. And then you work on articulation, which is a you know all those kind of things. Different styles of music require different articulation. So, if I know it's a jazz gig coming up, I'm gonna like play a lot of jazz heads and try to hone in on my articulation on how I do it. If I'm gonna play a classical gig, then I'm gonna do a lot a lot of a lot of arpeggios that outline chords and scales that I'm tonguing very staccato, very short on. Mm-hmm. And then uh, then the other thing that I that I feel like I got to practice all the time is just improvisation. So that's another part of my practice session where I'll, I have a, a long list of tunes that I pretty much know by memory. And I'll try to play them without any kind of a, like a lot of people practice improvisation and jazz with backing tracks. Um, Jamie Abersalds were famous when I was a young kid, and but now there's this app called uh, iReal Pro, which is you type in a chord progression and it generates a rhythm section for you. There's that, <laughs> but I try to I try to not use those things. I try to use my inner sense of time and phrasing. And if if I'm playing a tune and improvising it, and I get lost in that format when it's just me, then I know I don't really know the tune. So then I have to slowly mm-hmm. go through and so I'll, I'll, I'll outline all the chords and try to make sure that I understand the progression of chords and where they happen in time and space. And then I'll try imp- improvising in a simple way. Anyway, it's, it's just a whole strategy where you're, you also are playing mind games with yourself during these practice sessions because it's not purely physical. It's also mind games, you know, like, building confidence in yourself that you can actually play. So when you do play, you're not second guessing. 
and you and you can be more in the moment. It's a lot of stuff like that. That's what my practice sessions are like. Sometimes I'll I'll whip out a a book. Like there's a famous book called Arbins for trumpet. Um, it's kind of it's really thick, so people call it the Bible of trumpet playing. <laughs> anyway, sometimes I'll whip out that thing and just read exercises that I used to play when I was a very young trumpet player. And because uh, that that will help so many things about how to play the horn, including endurance. But I'm, I'm very careful okay. when I'm doing my practice sessions that I'm not getting to the point where my, it's just, well, any, any kind of physical endeavor you do, you want to work yourself to the point where you're building, you're not tearing down. Mm -hmm. And so that's, okay. what, that's, that's the thing about playing a musical instrument. You try to do the same thing, especially with a brass instrument where it's a very physical act to play the thing. I try to push myself to where I know that's as far as I can go in terms of uh, range, endurance, et cetera. And I'm not going to do something quote wrong to screw myself up for, you know, the rest of the practice session or, the, or tomorrow or the gig that's in two days, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Totally shifting gears. Mm -hmm. Just going to, you know, grind so something this is going to go back now we're going to go way back to college days again central college yes days. you had a friend help me out here who had a younger brother you know where i'm going yeah now. matt mckagan you think that's i think that's yeah, where you're your going friend <laughs> yes yeah you're right exactly matt so did so matt went to central as well yeah i met matt at central okay. it might have been my junior or senior year he came in as a freshman okay Really strong trombone player. He came out of the Roosevelt High School program. Um, and that's how I met him. And we were we were in that band okay. together. That band that year won the Pacific Coast Jazz Festival, the John Mowat up in front of the band. It was really special. Okay. A lot of players in that band went on to, to amazing careers in music. Anyway, yeah, he was a friend. Still is. Still is. So... You were working during the summer, correct? Yeah. At, yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, my my gig, my my gig that I would do, my day job is I would work forty or more hours a week at Safeway, and the store I worked at is on Sixty Fifth and Ballard. For all you people in Seattle, okay. you know where that is. Um, so, what were you doing at Safeway? What did they have you doing? I I, I worked produce and night crew. And I did a little bit of checking, but mostly okay. it was produce and night crew. All right. And I was making journeyman wages because at that time, I, I started <laughs> working for Safeway when I was in high school as a box boy. <laughs> and at that time, you could work your way up <laughs> from box boy to journeyman just by accumulating numbers of hours in each of the steps along the way. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty cool. I could support myself. Yeah, you're my working, whole college year yeah. by working just summers at Safeway. Right. Back then. I, yeah. I my first job was as, as a box boy at a at another chain. So yeah, I mm -hmm. get the I get the deal. You know what I'm talking about. I was about. making a, you know, three dollars and three dollars and twenty nine cents an hour when I started, which was which Well, was that's good a lot. Money. I made two twenty three an hour yeah. when I started. Of course yeah. I'm a little older than you. Yeah. So <laughs> So you were able to stay with him. Correct during the summer, so that yeah, you had well, a place to, a place what to happened was my mom and dad moved from the west side of the state, where I had had some jobs working at Safeway, and they moved to Spokane. I tried. This was, I think, recessionary times, maybe in early eighties. I tried and tried to get a job at Safeway, et cetera, et cetera, in Spokane, Washington. I could not get a job, so I called. Out of desperation, I called. Um, my old store manager in Linwood. And I said, you know, I really need a job. Can you, is there anything available? I'll, you know, I'll come over there and I'll find a way to live. And so, um, he put me on hold for a minute. He goes, okay, call this number. And it turned out to be the Ballard store manager who happened to be married to the assistant manager at 
my old Linwood store, and they needed somebody right away to work night crew. And I'd done night crew, all, all, so that mm. I was experienced. It's what they needed. So I had to find a place to live. Uh, I, I couldn't figure out what to do, so I called my friend Matt, who I knew lived in uh, somewhere in Seattle. I didn't really know where he lived. And I said, hey, Matt, do you know where I could... Do you know anybody that's like leads a roommate or has, you know, some kind of living arrangement just for the summer where I could live? And he goes, well, hold on a minute. So he sets the phone down. I'm going to hear all this back in the background. He gets back on like a minute later. He goes, well, you can live, you can live here. I said, what? He goes, yeah, we have a big house here. You can live here with me and my brother and my mom. You know, there were six kids in the family and we've got all these extra bedrooms now in this house. And you can just live here. My, and I said, well, my, yeah, my mom says a hundred bucks a month. And I was like, okay. And I said, well, where is it? And so he told me, and it was the, what I, I call the backside of the U district, you know, heading towards sound point, the, the downside of the, the ridge there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was perfect. Cause it was just like a five miles drive to the store I was going to work at. So, yeah. yeah. So I ended up moving, moving over and moving into the McKagan house. So his younger brother's a well-known name now, but he wasn't then. Yeah, you're talking about <laughs> Duff. Duff McKagan. Yeah. And so what was that like? What was he? So how old was he at that time, do you think? He was uh, ninth grade, maybe. Something like that. Okay. So freshman in high school. I, yeah, I think, okay, I, so I, young, I think he had just kid. finished. Uh, he had just finished his time at uh, the middle school. And I remember he played in a trombone trombone in band what's the middle school that goes there um it feeds into roosevelt it's uh Eckstein. Eckstein middle school anyway he wasn't playing trombone okay. anymore he was getting into right punk rock and so you know i met him and i he he had uh certain attributes that he had done to himself physically that uh, telegraphed right away that he was a punk rocker, <laughs> such as hair and uh, piercings. And I don't remember if he had tattoos or anything like that, but I thought, wow, this, this is like hardcore here. And so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if he didn't continue going to school or not. I don't really recall for sure. Um. But that, that first year, I actually lived with, with uh, the McKagans two different summers. And then into the second summer I, I is when I was a student teaching. And then I ended up getting a full-time teaching job later that year. So that first, or first year, I didn't really get to know Duff that much. But mm-hmm. I did know this, that me working night crew at that Safeway store meant that I would come home at mm, 8, 9 in the morning and then go to bed. Duff would come, I think he was still in school or he had friends or whatever, but he would come back to the house like noon or one o'clock and they'd start jamming at the house on punk rock. And of course I'd only had like three hours of sleep at the time and I was going crazy. You were young. (laughs) Yeah. But it drove me crazy (laughs) because, um, you know, and it was his, it was his house. What was I supposed to do? Say, no, you can't do this because I'm trying to sleep. So, so I think that's how I maneuvered myself into working produce where I could work days. <laughs> um, and I, I still did occasional night crew depending on it was summer, you know, people's vacation schedules. That's mostly what I did is I filled in for full timers that were on vacation right. and night crew and produce. So anyway, I didn't get to know him that well, but the next, the next summer, um, Duff was starting to drive and I remember helping him. I didn't actually go with him to go look at a car, but he was asking me about cars and stuff because I actually I had a 65 Mustang that I did some work on at, at their house. Um, simple things, nothing big. Um, so he was asking me about cars and things. And I said, well, I think he got it. He ended up getting a, a Maverick. Remember those things? Ford Maverick. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I do. So I said, you know, basically that's, you know, that's kind of like a, in many ways, like a Mustang, because cars from model to model had 
engines, transmissions, et cetera, that were shared between different models. So anyway, but that, that next, he was starting to realize that he needed to get a job. So, um, and we were getting, you know, more acquainted as you would might say. Um, but I, I still remember he had a job interview that I, I, he had told me about and I was sitting there at the kitchen table. You could see the front walk coming into the house from the kitchen table. And he's coming home from his interview and he's wearing my, one of my sport coats. <laughs> and I, w- I was like, <laughs> uh, he came in the door. I said, so that's my sport coat. He goes, yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought I could just borrow it. I thought it would be okay. And I was like, uh, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> It's not okay because who being, uh, I don't know if you'd call it the culture, but you know, his involvement in the punk rock scene, who knows if he would end up after his interview going somewhere and leaving my coat and getting whatever spilled on it. And then he would do things like he'd put orange juice in his hair. He'd, He'd pour, like he'd take the orange juice container out of the fridge and pour it in the cup of his hand and then splash it on the top of his hair. That would, that was like his hair hair goop, you know, (laughs) and who, you know, who knows if that would get all over my sport coat, et cetera. And so the other thing that, that, you know, I was really into (laughs) stereos and stuff. So I had a really nice stereo. I, I, I went, I came home one time and and things weren't, didn't look quite the same with my stereo. And I, somehow I brought it up and he goes, Oh yeah, I was listening to records on your stereo yesterday. And I was like, dude, no, (laughs) That's my stuff. Just because I, we're not brothers. <laughs> I think I might have said that. Yeah. You know, I, I live here, but we're we're not like I'm not I'm not like Matt where you can go borrow his stuff and that's just what brothers do. Oh. Oh my gosh. So it was it was like that. Um, you know, and then and then um uh, I think it was actually that fall after that second summer. I was student teaching at 180 High School, and then my sister, Jennifer, moved into the house for three months in one of the other bedrooms because she was student teaching, I think, in Lake Washington School District. Um, and so she got to see this firsthand. You know, we, you know, it's weird. I, <laughs> I haven't really talked to her about it in a long time, but now that I'm remembering this, it might be fun to talk about. But, um, that I, but I ended up living at at their house clear into the next summer, maybe even the, a third summer, but that whole year because I student taught in the fall and then I continued to work at Safeway during like January, February, and then I got a long-term sub-teaching job at Vashon Island High School. So I was driving from the McKagan house to Vashon Island every day for the remainder of the school year. And then I, I think That's I ended up... I, I Yeah, it is. It wasn't too bad in those days. Um, yeah, but still, it's, it's, still, you gotta, yeah. Well, but you you shared you 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 guys commuted. You took a you, there was a car on the island. So well, I still had to get but, I had to get to the Fauntleroy dock. But the nice thing, yeah. I would drive by the Rainier Brewery every day. That mm-hmm. was just a you know the smell of the brewery was. I don't know. I liked it. <laughs> so anyway. You I like think it was through the through the brewery. part of the part of the next summer I ended up living with them, and then I ended up going back over to Central because I was going to be a grad student the next fall, and so that was my my time with the McKagans. Okay. And um, that second that second year I was there, Matt, the older brother, actually left Central and ended up moving down to uh, the L.A. area and went to school at. Um, Oh, what is it? Northridge, Cal State Northridge. They had a really good jazz program. He didn't think things at Central were for him. And so he ended up going to Northridge. He actually graduated from Northridge, and he's been teaching middle school band in uh, north of L.A. ever since. Okay. So anyway, he was in L.A., and the I think the right after I – Ended up coming back to Central. Duff moved down to L.A. to see what the music scene was like. And, of course, during the time that he was there, he was in a bunch of different bands. 
Uh, the most famous one that people might remember is called the Fastbacks. He was involved with, mm-hmm. but he had another band, um, something to do with cleavers. And their meat, a meat cleaver was like the the band's right logo thing. And then they had this house. They called it Cleveland. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. Anyway, he, mo- he Duff moved down there to be with Matt, and during his first few weeks there, uh, he went into a music store. Well, maybe I'll back up a little bit too. During the time he was in Seattle, he played guitar and drums mostly. That's that's what mm-hmm. he did. Does that mean he was a guitar player or a drummer like we think of those? No, because the the mindset of punk rocks is punk rock at the time was you could play anything you wanted. Didn't matter if you could play mm-hmm. it or not. You would just play it. And so that's kind of how, mm-hmm. how he operated. But anyway, he, when he was in L.A., he went to a music store and there was a three by five card up there. that said, looking to form band. I'm a guitar player, need a bass player. And that card was put up by Slash. And that's, that's how Duff met Slash and became a bass player and was in Guns N' Roses. He answered an that's, ad in the yeah. classic way at a music store posting board. Posting board. Yeah, see, I think that's just that's a that's a really interesting take on that whole that whole story of his. Yeah, um, the orange juice in the hair. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I remember another another thing. You know, I was, I was commenting about piercings and jewelry. I, if I remember right, he had had a tooth pulled um, at some point, and he had the tooth mounted on a little chain, and then put on a post and stud and he had it in his ear as an earring, this tooth hanging down. That was his own tooth. Okay. Yeah. I I remember that. I think it was his own tooth. But I I remember the tooth. Yeah. So, well, as we wrap this up, cause that's just, we'll just, I don't know that you can top a, your own (laughs) tooth hanging off your ear story. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know put you on the spot sure if you could play with any musician live or dead who would you want to play with the first one that springs to mind is chick korea okay the pianist he just died so why in the last couple of years i just I I always admired uh, the musical precision that he played with and okay. the breadth of styles that he could play. And his original compositions were mm-hmm. just, there was, there were so many uh, directions that his compositions could go within a composition or just from composition to composition. But you could always tell it was Chick Corea. Um, and I just really always dug what what he did during his career. Um, I don't know. There's there's lots of players. I think somebody else that I would love to play with would be Michael Brecker, the tenor player, brother to Randy Brecker. Just one of the the great players of the instrument, um, still to this day. Um, sadly, he passed away. 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. It was a long, it's been a long time now. Um, but same thing. One of those uh, trailblazers of the instrument. And the thing that was cool about him, he played with groups. He was, he was a, not only was he a fabulous jazz saxophonist, but he played on so many other people's records. Like I was just listening to a Steely Dan record a couple of days ago and he's playing tenor sax on there. You know, which and he could put you on the spot. Oh, well, which which album? Uh, Ga- Gaucho. Gotcha. All right. So now, once again, do you have a favorite Steely Dan album? I think of all the all their albums, I like Asia the best, which was the one right before Gaucho. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have a CD of that. It's on LP, so I don't listen to it much. I should get it out and because I have a really nice 
turntable and stuff. But anyway, just I like the the tunes on Asia to me are where the the mindset of all that musical writing on there vibes with me uh, more than other Steely Dan records because it's very jazz related, and all the players are jazzers on there, and it's just really cool. I remember when it came How out. How do you feel being, about? Go ahead. How do you feel about the Donald Fagan solo, the the Nightfly? I like that too, and I also like the two, the two later uh, albums that came out, like twenty years later. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything must change. I don't like as much as um, what's the other one? Two against nature. Two against nature. I of of all the records that they've ever recorded, that's the one that I use when I'm testing my audio system. <laughs> oh. If, if okay. I use new speakers okay. or something, because it's so well recorded. And the thing is, whenever I put that on in the house, my whole family goes, oh, not that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, that, right. that would my be another, another, another musician that I would like to play with, with would be Donald Fagan. Just for right. all those so reasons. Last, you know. Have you ever seen him live? Yeah. Yeah, just once. Yeah, I've seen him a few He's times. He's in Portland. Okay. Last question. You can pick three. We'll do the variation of the Desert Island Disc, but what would you can take three three albums with you. What are you going to take? Hmm. Wow. Well, I think I would take a Steely Dan album, either Asia or Two Against Nature. Okay. Okay. Um, I would take three quartets by Chick Corea, which has, okay, which has uh, Michael Brecker on it. It's a quartet, jazz quartet and Michael Brecker's sax player on that Steve Gadd on drums and, um, Eddie Gomez on bass. That's, that's one of my most favorite records. And I would, I would have to have that. Um, so I, okay. one more, hmm. You get one more. I know this this may be weird and it's maybe inter- influenced because I just listened to this the other day. But there's this album the Seattle Symphony put out with the Lincoln portrait on it. Um, it's a bunch of Aaron Copeland music. Mm. Lincoln portraits on there. Okay. Fanfare for the common man. I don't know. I there's something about that record. I keep going back to it because it's just so good. Okay. Um. I don't know. There's okay. there's so many records I could say, um, but those are all well, ones yeah, it's, I've, it's, it's, I've it's listened impossible... to recently, and that, so they come right. to mind. It's an impossible exercise. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I I would agree with you that a for me a Steely Dan record would make the which one I'm not quite sure. Probably Asia, probably. But yeah. Um, I found myself listening to Gaucho lately a lot though, but it's just me too. Not quite. It's just, but it's not quite as substantial as Asia. Asia is just totally this, agree. Yeah. But it's, yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy Gaucho a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. That was a record I hadn't really listened to until just a few years ago. I, I kind of knew about it and I knew a couple of tunes off of it. But I, I was surprised to find out that it won a bunch of, and was nominated for some Grammy things, the year it came out. Well, I think, honestly, I think it's probably due to Asia being so um, earth shattering that they they might have gotten nominated because of <laughs> yeah. you know that they missed the window for Asia that so it's like well I'll throw them one now I not that it's sure. a, it's it's a great album don't get me wrong but it's not it's not Asia Asia's uh, yeah, Asia is one of those, you know, I don't know. I think no matter what musical genre you prefer, I think most everybody would, who listens to Asia goes, wow, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, definitely. So, well, you know, and I've, have you ever watched the, the, the documentary on the, the, of the making of the, uh, making of that album? No, I didn't know and there was how many one. guitar, how many guitar players they went through for the solo. I can't remember what song it was, but there's a solo that they went through like seven guitar players before yeah. they finally got somebody that could do it the way, you know, they wanted it. Um, 
Yeah, it's legendary. I mean, the, that a... sort of approach, you know, even what snare drum to use. Like if you go into any of the really big studios, uh, they might have a a room filled with just snare drums, like 20 of them on a shelf. And which snare drum sound do you want? <laughs> That's the way these guys... They're operated and uh it's astounding you know but that's that's why so many people like when you go to a sound check at a like a stadium show or something like that inevitably the sound guys are going to play a steely dan record through the pa to get their mix set right right EQs i was uh, i had a, another guest on uh his name is jesse butterworth he's a musician out of seattle and uh he recorded his first solo album and he went to Abbey road studios to do it. Mm. And, uh, he's describing the, you, you go into Abbey road and you can say, um, you know, I'm just making this up, but you know, uh, I'd like to use the piano that J John used for, um, you know, just mm -hmm. they'll bring out the instruments that was, you know, you can, you can, you can actually you know, uh, use something that McCartney or Lennon or, you know, used. Um, yeah, that's. I don't know. You know, what that the would big, like. the big places like that. That's the way it is. I've been fortunate to be inside Capitol Records Studios down in L.A. Oh. Um, and you go in there, and there's you know, gold records on the wall, and you realize this is the room that Frank Sinatra recorded <laughs> in. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's it's the, just that's the. Do, piano am I worthy of walking into the room? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's I, pretty wild. I, I would, I would, that would get in my head. That would, I would, that would get in my head. So, well, yeah. listen, I am going to let you go. I, uh, this was, I, I thank you so much for taking the time to, to come back and, and let's, you know, we we're able to talk more about your musical journey. And I'm looking forward to, I know, I know you're going to be performing. So I'm looking forward to um, being able to come in and actually listen to you play live. And, uh, I know our paths will cross in Ellensburg one of these days because oh yeah, you know, it's not you a big come town. through here. It's the crossroads <laughs> of the state. Yes, crossroads. It's so funny to me that it, it really is. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciated being on here again, and uh, I'll look forward to meeting you in person. Yes. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.